Psalm 133, if you, if you look at it, it's only three verses. Do you realize that? I think it's the shortest chapter I've picked as we've gone through the Psalter. So how could you possibly speak for 30 minutes on three verses? It's really not a problem. Uh, it's going to take me a few minutes to get to, uh, to actually get to verse 1. Uh, I want to kind of build the, build the scene. So uh, it's going to be a little bit longer into than I typically do. So just kind of bear with me. You'll understand as I get into this. Uh, I remember the, the, the first uh, pers- personal contact that I had with a guy that I'll call Dave. Uh, this was at my uh, last church that I planted in California. I was 31 at the time, all excited. Uh, and he was a new personer. Uh, and I ran into him to the church office by accident. Uh, we rented a two-story office complex, and I was uh, uh, upstairs, and I came down through the interior staircase, and he was you know, s- standing there talking to the secretary, so I introduced myself, uh, and this is what he told me. He said, hi, Pastor Marty, uh, I'd let you know my name's you know, Dave, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming here from a very large church, of which I have issues with that large church, and so I'm, I'm going to come to this church plant and uh, see how I like it with my family, and I just want to let you know right up front that uh, you're going to have to earn my respect. <laughs> huh? Yeah. I think I've heard it all after 32 years of pastoring a church. So I, as a new pastor, uh, wasn't going to let that erroneous, uh, arrogant statement go. So I said something to the tune of, uh, Dave, nowhere in Scripture does it say that I have to earn your respect. Uh, Paul does say in his letter uh, to Timothy, uh, let those th- that the elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. I said, based on that, uh, I don't see anywhere in there where Paul says you have to earn their respect. You should give respect to the position. Uh, He smiled, didn't say anything to me, uh, and left. I should have taken that as my first cue. Things were not going to go well. Uh, uh, For the next, I would say, probably seven years, uh, he subverted, opposed, undermined, criticized, tore apart every decision that I made and along with the elder council as well. Um, He would typically come into my office with a statement such as this. Uh, He was self-employed, so he could kind of leave his job whenever he wanted to, whenever the spirit moved him to come talk to me, so, uh, (laughs) which is quite often. Uh, He he came into my office, uh, you know, one day, and and this is typically how things would go for him. Hey, Pastor Marty, uh, I was communing with the spirit this morning. The spirit told me X, Y, Z. And And what he would tell me that we needed to do as a church was the antithesis of what I was articulating we needed to do, and it was the opposite of what the elders wanted them to do. But when somebody prefaces what they're going to say with, the Holy Spirit has told me, how in the world do you argue with them? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so uh, I told him I, I'm several times, uh, uh, Dave, I'm, I kind of kind of I find it strange that every time that you offer the way the church should go vision-wise and how we should function and everything, uh, it's, 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 the, it's diametrically opposed to everything that I as a pastor think should happen, along with the elder council, and we've prayed about this for quite a while. Why are you always the opposite of all of us? Uh, very interesting. Uh, he was, uh, uh, in my estimation, now looking back, uh, he did not have the gift of encouragement. <laughs> uh, he had the gift of uh, discouragement, and he was a troublemaker. So, uh, what do you do when you're a young pastor planting a church and everything's at critical mass and you need everybody that you can get? Um, you put them on the worship team. That's what I did. Uh, I tried to build a bridge to him, showing grace, mercy, and I, I put him on the worship team uh, because he had uh, uh, guitar ability uh, and some singing ability, and so I put him on there uh, with other people. Um, and it wasn't long before the worship team had huge issues, self-destructed before my eyes. It wasn't too, I mean, part of the job as a pastor is you're a detective. Did you know this? Search, what in the world happened to the worship team? Fell apart. Uh, so I wisely moved him off the worship team. That was a fiasco. Uh, and I didn't learn from that. Uh, and when I moved him off the worship team, peace ensued on the worship team. Funny how that works. Um, because he had expertise in sound, I put him on the sound team. Running the soundboard back in the sound booth. Uh, it, it was uh, interesting. It wasn't long Uh, until he who was following the Holy Spirit destroyed the sound team. They're fighting with each other. There's hurt feelings and everything. I'm like, what in the world? So I pulled him off the the sound team, but not before he did this for, I don't know, probably two years. And as he's working the sound panel and all the buttons and everything, I thought he was working the sound panel. Oh, no. He had a little yellow notepad next to the sound booth, and he's copiously writing in it all the time. And after most sermons 
he would slide a six to eight page letter under my office door to tell me how to preach, how to teach, how to be more effective as a pastor, what he theologically liked, didn't like. This was so encouraging to me. I'm like, who is this guy? He hasn't even been to seminary. Unbelievable. But he was trying to hell me. Uh, I removed him from the uh, sound team. Uh, and I decided, well, I should show grace and mercy to him and try to help him grow up and mature in Christ. So I put him on the uh, worship council. <laughs> what do they do? Uh, well, they planned all the worship services. What do you think happened? Now, uh, so <laughs> they met in, met in this living room as some parishioners and planned all the worship songs and every, how the flow of the worship was go going to go and everything. Uh, and I remember the meeting that was the meltdown meeting. It, it was explosive. They all ended up leaving, you know, vowing never to come back. There was no way they were going to work with him, et cetera. And I'm like, wherever I put you, it's a problem. So I removed him from the worship team. I, I thanked God Almighty the day he left the church. Because I learned a long time ago, uh, you don't need everybody. Because some people are not there for the right reasons, and I think the devil sent them. Uh, when, he, when he left, uh, <laughs> Uh, I felt the Holy Spirit was moving him to move, and that was great that he got the same idea, and, and he left. Um, he actually went to a, a church uh, of a friend of mine uh, who I went to seminary with, uh, and about a year after he went to that church, I didn't know where he went. I was with my friend uh, for lunch uh, and uh, said, hey, how's your life going as a pastor? Oh, it's terrible. It's miserable. <laughs> I said, well, why? He goes, I got this guy. Got this guy. He said, the first Sunday that he showed up at our church, he's like on the front row, and he... We announced a business meeting. He showed up at the business meeting. He spoke in the business meeting about things that he didn't like. Huh? I said, is he about 5'7"? Uh-huh. Is he brown hair? Parts it on the side? Yeah. About 145 pounds? Hmm? Good luck. I'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I'll tell you this little story. I'll tell you this. Uh, unity in a church is a huge thing. And I would say, like, it's the major thing. I mean, unity is what you got to have. If you don't have unity, you can't do anything because you're so busy trying to fix the sound team, the worship team. The, if you're so busy doing that, you're not focusing on, on what you need to be doing. Trust me, I know. Uh, Jesus, last, his last prayer that he prayed for his people, the church, was in John 17. Go read it with your small group and pay attention how many times he's praying for oneness in his body. Oneness, unity. Uh, Paul uh, experienced his fair, uh, his fair share of Dave's. Uh, remember, I told you I'm getting to Psalms. In case you're wondering, I'm getting there. Uh, uh, Paul faced Dave many times. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he writes this to the Ephesian church. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner, Dave, worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And, and, and then what does that look like? Um, he says, do this with what? All, that's not hubris. With all what? Humility and gentleness and patience. Mm, showing forbearance to one another uh, in a spirit of criticism and analysis. No, love. And then he throws in this one. Being diligent to preserve what? Unity of the spirit and the bond of shalom. It's irene in Greek, but peace. You're supposed to be all about peace. Now, I don't know. I mean, I ask you this all the time because I like grammar, but uh, participles are important especially the one in verse three, being diligent is a participle. Uh, the, the Greek word here, spudansides, um, means to hastily go after something. I mean, don't drag your feet, don't waste any time. So since it's a participle, uh, and it's a present tense participle, he's saying, as a Christian, you constantly should be living with the spirit of pursuing unity at all costs. Dave never got the memo, because wherever he went, it was disunity, and it was all those people have problems, it's not my problem. No, God wants us to pursue unity in the body. Uh, I would say to you, after being here in this November, I will have been here 13 years, uh, one of the greatest things about our church is that very thing, unity. It's the very thing the devil hates. Because if he can divide your families, husband and wife and children, etc., then he, then he starts working on the church, then, he, then he's got it. He can hamstring you to where you can't do what you're called to do. Uh, God wants us to be united and to stay united. That's why we've done so much for God. Because it's hard for God to do great things in a spirit of disunity. But the devil's always working. Uh, what's this got to do with Psalm 133? Everything. Because there's only three verses. And guess what it's about? Unity. 
It's unity. Now, this is a pilgrim song, a song of ascent. So as Israel uh, walked to worship, literally uphill, uh, to get up to the temple, uh, they sang songs as they went. And when they got there, they sang songs when they're looking at the temple. This is a song they sang when they're looking at the temple. What are they singing on the temple mount? Well, these words, that, that God would make us unified. Because why? Because Israel had a long track record of the devil dividing people. I mean, go think about it. Adam and Eve were divided against God. Adam was divided against Eve. Cain was divided against Abel. Ham was divided against Noah. Lot was divided against Abraham. Ishmael was divided from Isaac. Joseph's brothers were divided against him. And on and on and on it goes. Where does that come from? The devil. Look at our country. Is it united or divided? Divided. Where does it come from? The devil. The devil. So what does God want from his church? Well, it starts out in verse 1 of this chapter where the main motif is clearly articulated. It's easy to see that God desires to bless you, you as a person, you as a father, as a mother, as a family, you as a church, uh, through unity, unity. And he's going to lay out the big idea in the first verse, and then he's going to give you two illustrations uh, in verses 2 to 3. So we're going to spend most of our time on verse 1 because it's the, the essence of everything. So if God desires to bless us uh, through unity, not disunity, because disunity is from the devil, uh, we need to understand this unity thing and protect it at all costs, correct? And so here we look at what I would call the rule is you, as a Christian, based on Ephesians 4, 3, should constantly pursue unity. So let's read what the text says about unity. It says, this is a song of ascents. Who wrote it? David. David. Did his life, was his life just, just dripping with unity? Uh, no. So if anybody knows about the importance of unity, it's going to be David, King David. What does David have to say? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Man, it's awesome, he says. When you see somebody, see a group of people, see a family, that there's absolute unity there. Now, the very first word in the Hebrew text, hine, is behold. And it's not a verb, which it's supposed to be. But since it's not a verb, it means it's totally emphatic. So it's completely emphatic. Um, have it, <laughs> I was driving down a road the other day that I knew there were speed bumps and I was downhill and I forgot there were speed bumps. You ever do this? And in my, I'm in my little Volvo S60 low to the ground, you know? It's not good to do that when you hit them going too fast. Your head hits the ceiling, you know? It's like, oh man, that's like behold. God says, hey, let me grab your attention and pay attention to what I want you to know. He says, it's good and it's pleasant for brothers to dwell in unity. Do you? Do you pursue unity or are you Dave? Um, one of my best friends growing up was, uh, 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 and I called him not long ago just to see how he was doing, Billy Cartwright. Billy Cartwright was the biggest guy at school. That's why he was my friend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was 6'5", 300 pounds. I mean, when we did weightlifting, because I played baseball with him, when we, we, when we worked out, he's picking up the stack. So whenever I would, I was raised in a border town, rough area, tons of gangs, grew up with all those people. Uh, the gang, gangsters would always tell me on the weekends where not to go so they wouldn't have to jump me for gang initiation. That was convenient because I grew up there. They all knew me. Uh, but if I was with Billy, it was good because I went to a movie and my dad's like, we're going to a late movie. He's like, who are you going with? Uh, Billy. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Because <laughs> he was like having, you know, 20 people with you. So uh, Billy, uh, massive guy. In fact, uh, when I talked to him, uh, he told me that he, he won an arm wrestling uh, championship in the state of California. No kidding. I think he told me he was working out with a 120-pound dumbbell. He's massive. Anyway, that's a whole other story. I'll tell you some days. Pretty funny what happened when he won that championship. But he had a brother named Bobby. Bobby was about as big as Billy. And they lived in a mobile home out in the desert where I grew up. And so I'd go hang out with them on the weekends, ride mo motorbikes and stuff. But they would fight. They were massive. I wasn't my size now. I was skinny, really skinny. They were like several of me, each one of them. So when they would fight, when we were, you know, we were, I'd spend the night out there, uh, they, um, one night they picked up two by fours. And I'm not talking poking each other. I'm talking full swings. And they are connecting. There's some things you don't need to pray about. I mean, it was like God's will is for me not to be near these two crazy people. So I would just kind of slither away, you know, desert sand, let them fight it out. Uh, and their mom's yelling and screaming at them. And their dad was as big as they were. He said, what are you boys doing? He said, I can understand. You know, like when, when brothers are not in a state of unity, there's a lot of angst with the parents, right? Especially if they have two by fours, right? Now, now think about this. That, that, <laughs> that is what I remember of those two brothers. I didn't have a brother. The, those two brothers fought 
all the time. They loved each other, but it was unbelievable. But I've, lot, I've met a lot of Billy and Bobbies in church, like Dave, uh, who swing verbal two by fours to take out other Christians. And, and this has been going on forever. I mean, think about it. Miriam and Aaron criticized the God-ordained leadership of Moses. They criticized that. Uh, Christ disciples. I mean, go read the Gospels. They're constantly arguing about all kinds of different things. And the one that just absolutely blows me away in Matthew 18 is they had an argument about who was the greatest among them. They're following Jesus. And Jesus is like, what are you guys talking about, about back there? Oh, nothing, Lord. No, what, what were you talking about? Well, just which one of us is going to be the greatest? Unbelievable. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, remember, they mixed it up. First missionary journey, they're deserted by John Mark on, the, on that first missionary journey. Paul gets hot. He's upset. You don't desert, you don't desert other believers. Well, John Mark did, and so they, they had it out. It didn't take long for the church that was once unified to get disunified over a theological issue, uh, and the major church fight that they had, go read about it in uh, Acts chapter 15, was whether Christians, you know, Gentiles, when they got saved, had to obey the Mosaic law. The Judaizers said, yes, they should. Follow Jesus and follow the Torah. Uh, the, the other Christians, like James, the Lord's brother, said, no, 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 they, they don't have to do that. So they had a church fight. And I'm so glad they worked it out because I'm a Gentile. Aren't you happy? Uh, and, and they worked it out, and, and James said, let the Gentiles come in. They don't have to obey the law to get saved. Jesus saves. So historically, Psalm 133 uh, has, has been addressing an issue that's been going on forever. But historically, what's interesting about this particular uh, uh, three verses is scholars believe that David, when he wrote it, wrote it when he became the king. Because as he's the new king, he's thinking, what's the most important thing for my kingdom? Unity. Unity. Did he get unity? Well, no. Uh, because uh, he's anointed by Samuel privately as the king, but Saul is still the king. And what was Saul's attitude toward David? <laughs> I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take you out. So n listen to the words of 2 Samuel chapter 2, when David becomes the king when he physically becomes the king. Then the man of Judah came, and there they anointed King David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, it, uh, it was the man of Jabesh-Gilead who buried Saul. And David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead uh, after his coronation. And he said to them, May you be blessed of the Lord, because you have shown this kindness to Saul your Lord, and you have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you, and I also will show this kindness to you, because you have done this thing. And now, therefore, let your hands be strong be, and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. This is an interesting statement. Uh, Saul has been killed and beheaded, uh, and they, hu they hung him on the wall of Beit Shion. And I take people there uh, when we go to Israel. Uh, it's just south of the Sea of Galilee, the great Roman city. Uh, but back in the day, that, that's where his body was. And the, the man from uh, Jabesh Gilead uh, loved, loved Saul. They honored Saul because uh, when, you, when you read the scriptures, uh, the, the Amorites were about to wipe out their city. And it was Saul who came in and rescued them. So now that Saul has been killed, they go and snatch the body at risk of their own lives to bury him in an honorable way because he had protected their city. Honor to whom honor is due. David says, because you're honoring Saul, the former king, I honor you for honoring the king. David could have said, that guy tried to kill me on multiple occasions. I'm not going to honor him. No, David says, you're honoring him. I will honor the king. And I think it's awesome that you men from Jabesh Gilead uh, have taken the body to bury him in an honorable way. Um, what do we learn from this? Uh, what we learn from this uh, episode of David's life about pursuing unity uh, is sometimes you have to look over past the atrocities that have been committed against you and show grace and mercy and love and compassion. Sometimes you have to look over past atrocities. Uh, several years ago, I got a call from another parishioner uh, at my former church who caused me and my wife great uh, angst over the years. Not a very nice person. Uh, and she called me, and I was like, wow, I uh, can't believe you're calling me. Uh, and uh, she had a request, because she never called me. Uh, and so uh, when she called, she said, my daughter is going to be going to Georgetown uh, Law School uh, up here, uh, coming out from California. Uh, and she doesn't know anybody on the East Coast, and I see where this is going. I'm like, oh, oh, there's static on the line. I can't hear you. What? Yeah. 
uh, she said uh, she doesn't know anybody and she's not going to have a car and everything. So um, could you and Liz like build a bridge to her and get to know her? And if she needs to, a place to go on the weekends, I mean, could you like show her around? And I, I don't know, like, huh? Um, so at that point, um, did you ever read Mad Magazine as a child? Yeah, there, I always loved that. And I still have some of the old copies from back in the day. Um, the, the Shadow Knows, you know what I'm talking about? The shadow knows. It shows a, a guy, you know, petting a little poodle with a lady. I remember this one at a bus stop. He's petting this lady's little poodle, but his shadow is swinging the dog on a leash. That 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 kind of thing. So <laughs> that's your carnality speaking. So I'm thinking to myself, she's asking me this question. My carnal man steps in, and I'm thinking in my head as she's asking me, "Would you please do this?" My carnal man. What do you think my carnal man's saying? What would your carnal man be saying? Don't judge me. You're sitting there thinking, "I can't believe him." What would you be saying? Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? What would you be saying? There is no way. Hallelujah. (laughs) There's no way. I knew she's asking me. I was like, oh, no. Yes. Because the Spirit's spirit's telling me, Marty, Marty, sometimes, like David, you got to overlook past atrocities like King Saul and love that person anyway. I'm telling you, it is not easy. I've had to do it. So I'm not telling you that story to build myself up, but to tell you Go act like David. Go act like David. Uh, now, there, there's more to this story than, than uh, what took place there. Um, uh, when we look at David's life uh, and what things that went on with him, uh, right after he's coronated king and he dealt with the man from Jabesh Gilead, I mean right after that, read 2 Samuel chapter eight, uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, Abner, uh, the commander of Saul's army, while David's being coronated, Abner goes out in the state of Davidus, he, he crowns Isbosheth, Saul's son, king. Whoa, that's a positive mood for the nation. How'd that go? Well, Isbosheth was a very weak uh, king, and Abner knew as the commander of the armies he could control this guy. So he makes him king as opposed to David. Talk about disunity. David's trying to unite the people, Abner's trying to divide the people. That's unbelievable. So to make matters worse, after, at worst, after he uh, coronates uh, Isbosheth as the king, um, he tells David, I'm going to take my, my 12, my, my best soldiers, my best, best special ops guys, and they're going to fight your best. And we'll just have a hand-to-hand combat to see who could be the king. And so they did. 12 of, his, of uh, Ishbosheth's men, Abner's men, and 12 of David's men, and they fought it out hand-to-hand combat. At the end of the battle, all 12 lay dead in the sand. It was a draw. What did David do? Hmm. Did he go after Abner and take Abner out? No. No, he didn't. He didn't do that. He pulled back. From that, I, I learned a lot about this in Hebrews as a pastor over the years. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says much about that kind of activity. Notice what it says. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Why? Well, without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. Make every effort. Try your hardest to live at peace with all people. You know what I learned? Uh, from reading stories like Abner and Isbosheth fighting David and David pulling back and not trying to take out Abner and all that kind of stuff because your flesh wants to just, Lord, send lightning down and consume the person. No, 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 no. Pull back, but try to live at peace. And sometimes you realize, I can't live at peace. Did you know that? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes peace is impossible. Like my best arguments, my best evidence, my best data with Dave never broke through the hardened soil of his arrogance. Never. So I finally realized Hebrews 12, 14 is, he's Abner, and I can't make peace with him. So then I have to develop other relationships, other friends, protect other people from him, et cetera. But, but, but I can't make peace with someone who doesn't want to live in peace. Sometimes you have to get to the point where you understand that you're dealing with the Dave type, the Abner type, uh, and uh, there's no way you're going to be able to bridge, bridge to them. Because I have tried. Remember all the different things I put him on, trying to make peace with him? And every time I did it, he just went for more power. Unbelievable. Uh, David, I tell you, his life, just a small taste of his life, just, you might learn some things from him. Uh, to help put Psalm 133 in perspective about unity, we as Christians, like David, should constantly work hard for unity because that's what we're called to do. But let me lay down a couple more principles about unity that I've learned along the way that aren't necessarily in the text, but they're so important to understand. Number one. We don't strive for unity in a meaningless way at all costs, meaning I'm not going to sacrifice truth, biblical truth, just for the sake of unity. 
See, Jesus, uh, when he confronted the Pharisees in Matthew 23, woe to you Pharisees, he confronted them who destroyed Israel, the religious leaders. Uh, Jesus drew the line when it came to truth and said, you guys have crossed this line. And so Jesus, along with others, Peter, Paul, etc., James, etc., uh, they would strive for unity at all costs, but they wouldn't sacrifice biblical truth just to make unity happen. Neither will I, neither should you. Number two, uh, we do strive for unity in the essentials but grace and patience in the non-essentials. This is our church. This is my first uh, community church to ever be in because I was always in a Baptist denomination before I came here. I mean, I knew a Baptist mind thing, mindset completely. Uh, then when I've left denominational life to come here, I'm like, can I do this? It's a community church. We got Presbyterians, Lutherans, uh, Catholics, former Catholics. I mean, we got everybody here, right? And here, I'm Baptist. How am I gonna fit in there? It's unbelievable. But we've, it, we've worked well because I told the elder board at the time, if we can be united on the essentials, we can take on hell itself. And if we can understand what the non-essentials are and respect each other and debate and discuss in a respectful way, we can do great things for God. And so we have, well, we've had many discussions, but we've had great unity, even though we're from all different kinds of theological backgrounds. And God has blessed us. Why? Because we will go to the cross individually for, well, the deity of Christ the doctrine of the resurrection, the Bible's the word of God, man is born with inherited sin, there is a place called hell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what are the things that are like the non-essentials, which we will argue and debate over, right? Well, I am a five-point Calvinist, and it's God's way for my life. Huh? Well, I'm a three-pointer. I mean, me, me, me personally. Uh, you know, so does that mean I can't serve with someone who's a five-point Calvinist? I'll pray for them. <laughs> I hear one of them laughing at me right now. Uh, <laughs> and, and they'll pray for me, but, but we get along, do we not? Why? Because I respect you. I respect you. Uh, uh, is the rapture before the tribulation? Or is the rapture the same thing as the second coming? Some in our church think it's the same thing. Again, I pray for them. I talk to them. We debate. We discuss. They debate and discuss with me. Trust me, it happens. But we have mutual respect for each other because at the end of the day, we're both going to heaven. Uh, I mean, think about the other things. Um, should a, should a Christian have a glass of wine? I'm not a wine drinker, so I'm not trying to build a case. But should, have a, should a Christian have a glass of wine? Well, I, I personally don't have a problem with it. Uh, but scripture is against you being drunk. You know? So if you're, if, you know, if, but but if, if you're a weaker brother, and I'm a stronger brother, because I could have a glass of wine if I wanted to, uh, but if you're a weaker brother who has a problem with me doing that, then I'm not going to do it. Uh, and I don't like the way it tastes anyway. All, all the different flavors all taste the same to me anyway. I don't know what, you, what the deal is, but... Uh, should, should a Christian get a tattoo? Do you have a tattoo? Uh, should a Christian get a tattoo? See, this is stuff we divide over. They cannot come here. There's tattoos. Well, you know, if you go out and get a tattoo as a Christian, it's a skull with flames coming out and demons and everything. I'm like, huh? What in the world? Um, you know, but, you know, but if you do have those on your body, like some of my friends in California would say, hey, man, that is just my former life without Jesus. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, but if you're a Christian that gets one, I'm not freaking out. Why? Because I love you. I accept you. Uh, and you have to answer for God one day what that is. Uh, you know, but in the meantime, there's bigger fish to fry, right? But when it comes down to, to unity, it becomes a very difficult thing sometimes. So here's a, here's, here's a question I think you should pose. Am I concerned about external things or eternal things? Do you hear me? You should always ask yourself, am I concerned about external things or eternal things? Because I've seen it all in my walk with Christ. From their dress has to be so long, the hair has to be so long, this so much makeup, not that much makeup. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, so am I concerned about what? You can't have forgotten it at this point. It was just a few minutes ago. Eternal things or external things, etc. Now, uh, what is David all consumed with? with uniting his country, uniting his country. What am I concerned about as a pastor? Maintaining unity of the body in a country full of disunity. Now, what's the result? Now, that's what he talks about in verses two to three, and we'll just uh, close with this. Notice what he says. He says, verse two, he says, it, unity, is like, let's look at this little metaphor. It's like the precious oil up on the, on the head, coming down up on the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down on the edge of his robes. Huh? Or, whoa. You know, these are the kind of verses when you're preaching through the Bible, you want to go, can I go around that one? 
Uh, no, because it's important. He said, okay, when I think about unity, it, for David, he says, it's kind of like when they anointed the high priest Aaron, unity is like that. Wow, what, what does that mean exactly? Um, well, I think what it, it's looking at, and this is coming from Leviticus chapter 8 when they uh, are setting up for the, uh, the ordination, as it were, the anointing of the high priest, uh, pouring the anointing oil, oil, which represents the Holy Spirit, all over him as the high priest. They're saying the high priest Aaron, once, the, once it's poured on his head and it flows down his beard and, and you know, down his clothing, he is totally anointed and set apart to God to be the leader of the people. He said, Paul, David says, you know, unity is like that. You are like anointed from God with his spirit. You're set apart to do one thing. What's that? Pursue unity. That's why he says it like that. Similar for us. We are to pursue unity. I'll let you know that when he says it's, in verse 1, when he says it's good and pleasant for brothers to dwell together, but in some translations it reads unity, uh, it was really translated dwell together because the word is a tent word, meaning when you get your tents together, in their culture it was to protect the family, the tribe. That circling the tents, as it were, to protect the family was then translated unity. And so he says that, you know, when, when, the, when the priest is set apart from God, he has one job, to maintain unity in the body. Uh, you as a parishioner have every responsibility to be like that high priest, to strive for unity at all cost. Uh, but if truth is compromised, well, then you draw a line. Uh, secondly, he says that uh, unity is a lot like, um, well, verse 3. Let's read what it says. Unity is like, it's like the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, uh, coming down upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. God has commanded the blessing of unity. He's commanded it. And he said, I, when I think about it, unity is like the morning dew on Mount Hermon, up in the north of Israel. It's about 9,500, 10,000 feet. It's the tallest mountain in Israel. He said, I've been up there before, and I've seen dew all over the ground. It's amazing when you see the beauty of dew. And he said, I've seen it on the grass around Jerusalem, and it's amazing. He said, unity is like that morning water. What does dew do? Uh, well, it gives life. It gives nourishment to thirsty plants. That's what it does. Uh, what are you supposed to do? Be like that. That when I pursue peace, love, kindness, compassion, when I pursue all these things from God, uh, I am, as it were, being water of life to another parched soul. But our country doesn't get the, doesn't get the memo, do they? Because everybody's divided. Republicans are divided from who? You forgot. From Democrats. Conservatives are divided from progressives. Vaxxers are divided against anti-vaxxers. Uh, maskers are divided against anti-maskers. Woke people are divided against the unawakened. Uh, school boards are divided against parents and students. Hospital officials are divided against nurses and doctors. Um, fiscal conservatives are divided from uh, tax and spend socialists. Socialists are divided against constitutionalists. And on and on goes the list. But what should be happening in the church? Not that. Unification over truth. Uh, and being willing to hold to truths at all cost, but also doing what we can to build unity because we're the be the light shining on the hill to the culture. So I think you should have one prayer as you leave today. Prayer would be this. Lord, uh, Lord, make me a, a unifier, not a disunifier. Lord, make me a point of unity, not disunity. What does a unifier look like? I'll give you a picture in case you don't know. And I'll close with these words. What's a unifying person look like? Number one, they look at, at how to build, not to blast. Number two, they don't exploit weaknesses, they exploit strengths. They're a builder, a unifier. They are forgiving, they are not grudge holders. They are humble, not hostile from the get-go. He was hot, they was hostile from the get-go. Uh, they are soft-spoken, not snarky and sarcastic. They assume others are innocent until proven guilty, not the other way around. Uh, they don't keep a long list of wrongs. They can drag out and beat the other person with uh, when it's convenient. Uh, they don't reject the facts. They embrace the facts, and they learn from them. Uh, they use kind words, not cutting words. Uh, and, well, you fill in the rest of the blank for yourself. But your prayer is what? Lord, make me a, a person of un unification, not someone who spreads disunity. Uh, and may that unity start with me, because if we're unified in our family as a husband and a wife, and we're unified in our church, as I told you last week, then we're unified in our city, and we're unified in our county, and we're unified in our state, 
and we're unified in our country. Imagine if all the churches led the way. What could happen? Let's pray. God, help us to be reflecting the essence of your high priestly prayer that there would be oneness about us and that that oneness would be such a, a point of refreshment to the culture that they would want to know what that is all about and where that come from. And may that spirit of unity start with not just our church, but all churches across this great land and around this globe. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you.